We have now released issue three of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Download it for free at newthinkingaloud.org. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is Becoming a Mystic. My guest is Rod Chelberg, who is a physician who practiced medicine for over 25 years, was a medical director of a hospital, nursing homes, and hospice. He lectures on the topics of mysticism and A Course in Miracles. He is author of When God Calls, Say Yes, A Physician's Experience of Mystical Guidance. Rod is located in Bangor, Maine. Now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Rod. It's a pleasure to have you back with us on New Thinking Aloud today. Oh, thank you for having me back, Emmy. It's such a pleasure. This is your second interview with New Thinking Aloud, and in the first one, you shared stories of psychic and spiritual healing as a doctor, and today we're going to go a little deeper into that around your mystical abilities and how one can become a mystic. Correct. I'd like to share more of how this happens and how you can acquire it yourself. Wonderful. I know you shared a little bit in our previous interview, but can you give us some, maybe some highlights into how you began having these mystical abilities that you were even able to use in a medical setting when you were helping people with their lives? Well, here's the Reader's Digest version. I'm an ER doctor. I like it short and to the point. So in second grade, I had a near-death experience, and we talked about that. And I was left with three gifts, one, the ability to astral travel, second, the ability to see auras on people's hearts, and third, um, the ability to feel the presence and have a deep meditation. I didn't do anything with those gifts. I just wasn't accepted by my peers having those gifts, so I let them go. But later, as a medical student and into my internal medicine residency program, these gifts started to reemerge. So first, I started to feel the presence of something in the room with me. It was a loving presence. Then the second, I started to see auras on people. And my auras that I see are um, black to white. It's called a grayscale in art. But I see these different colors of gray. Then I started seeing the colors on people's hearts. And I saw red, which is divine love. I saw green, which is divine healing, and blue, which is divine creativity. So my heart is green, and and I see green on yours. So I know you're a healer. Then I started having more experiences where I started to see and hear the divine. And we talked about that a little bit. Um, where, Where we could hear guidance and being told what to do to help somebody seeing different um, aspects of when people leave, seeing their auras, seeing their uh, outlines, if you will, their astral uh, bodies. And that's where we stopped, I believe, last time. Well, I have been in the healing profession for a number of years. One could say, of course, you, you know that, but also you are able to pick up on the energetic frequency, or how would you describe what it is you're able to do with a person's uh, being. I know you've described it before as sort of like uh, an x-ray vision. (laughs) Yeah. We're all mystics. And we all have these mystical abilities. It's just it was trained out of us by society. So I just want to start off with that little thought. As, As you listen to this program, What if you could start to see and hear, and what if you could bring in these gifts? 
So you have two sets of senses. The first is your human senses. There's five of them. But the second one that you're going to learn to develop is your spiritual sense. And it's a spiritual sense of being able to see and able to hear. And where I see is in my third eye region is I have a superimposed picture. So I look at you. I see your human body. But up here, I see your spiritual body. And this is a skill that you can develop. I hear you, but I also hear your inner thoughts. And those, again, are, are abilities that you can pick up on. And third, I see your physical body, but I feel you. And I look into your eyes, and I can see your divine uh, Christ energy, God energy, Buddha energy, whatever you want to call it, divine love. So with practice and knowing what to do, you can develop these skills yourself. Before we get into some of the ways that people can develop their abilities as a mystic, can you share maybe somebody you've helped recently and how you help them with this divine sight that you have, these divine mystical abilities? The way I help people is, is when I talk with them, either in the ER or even recently, I share what I see. So a man was talking with me about a year ago and he was complaining about his back hurting. He was having headaches and dizzy spells and then his neck started hurting. And as he was talking, I saw his aortic valve uh, crystallize. It was calcified. And I stopped the conversation. I said, you need to stop right now and go to the ER and get checked out. I said, I know that you've got a critical valve. You're going to have surgery. And I said, you're going to be walking that day, and in five days you're going home, which is almost impossible. So he went to the ER, and sure enough, he had a critical valve, and he got surgery and had it replaced. So that's how I share um, my, my, my gifts. There was a lady who came in to the emergency room, and she was having panic attacks. She was anxious. And... Um, as I was talking with her and examining her, I asked her to lay down. And when I did that, I could see that her heart was being crushed by fluid, abnormal fluid collection around her, which made her very anxious because she's not pumping blood and her heart is stopping. So she immediately sat up. But the divine voice then said she has metastatic breast cancer and the cancer is around her heart sac and it's leaking water. It's crushing her heart. So we did an emergency paracentesis, which is putting a needle into the heart and draining off the fluid and saved her life. So those are just a couple examples. When people transition from this world to the next, many times if I'm at the bedside, I get to see their divine white aura leave. And I will see either loved ones there to, to help take them home. In my own dad's case, I saw all of his family. I've seen angels um, come to help take people home. I've seen divine Christ come to take people home. It's all a matter of learning to get very quiet and trust that what you're seeing is real. And if you gain confidence, that vision gets easier. So then I share with the family how the healing occurred and that the divine came or a loved one came. And everybody feels this wonderful peace, this presence of peace. So there's a few stories that I could fill this whole hour up with stories. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope people do check out the first interview, and I'm going to link to that in the upper right corner of your screen. And that one is Dr. Share Psychic Stories of Healing. Yeah. So let's get into how people can embrace their own inner mystic. Their own inner mystic is a recognition of uh, a mystic is somebody who has woken up to the fact that they are a divine being inside of a human body. The, in the Eastern tradition, that's called enlightenment. And we're all mystics. We've all had those little nudges of you know, I should go down this road or I shouldn't go to the movie tonight. Those are mystical experiences and we just poo-poo them and we don't validate them 
And what you have to start doing is, is learning to quiet your mind first and foremost. If your mind is chatty and thinking, try talking to somebody who's very excited about something. You just can't do it. So you learn to develop a, a very deep quiet and a very deep peace. Now you can hear and see because what's actually happening is you are tuning in to, to Emmy, your divine presence, to God's divine presence, to my divine presence, and, and we're all linked together. It's a different set of senses that we have. It's a spiritual muscle that's up here in our third eye, if you will, that needs to be strengthened. So we get quiet so we can hear what the divine has to say. I'm quiet so I can hear what you have to say. So this is my the start is meditation is a good way to practice. A time of taking, um, stop thinking. It could be five minutes twice a day. It could be a minute twice a day. But that's how you start is with, with some type of a quieting process. The meditation can be a walk in the woods. It, for me, it was long distance running. I'd do five, ten miles. That was my meditation. I would just check out. You can do a sitting meditation, a formal meditation. You can go for a walk in nature. You can paint. Something that totally shuts your mind down. And you feel a oneness of what you're working with. So that's a prerequisite, if you will, to doing this. I have to get centered in that divine uh, energy, that divine Christ consciousness, that divine love, divine Buddha energy, whatever you want to call it, that love that's centered, that is within you, you need to center yourself in that. So that's the first step. For you, what kind of meditations have you practiced? Because I'm sure people listening are going to be thinking, well, what did he do? My practice is very simple. And it's the basis of all meditation, which is I start in the morning at, at about six o'clock and I read spiritual literature. I, I read a Daily Word from Silent Unity. I read Joel Goldsmith. And then I read from A Course in Miracles, which is an independent self-study course on spirituality. That calms my mind down and gets rid of what's called the monkey chatter, all these random thoughts that are flying around. You want to quiet that all down. So I do that by reading. I like my coffee, so I have half a cup of coffee, which I guess in many traditions that's a big no-no, but it's okay. Then I sit down in a, a reclined chair that's, that's comfortable, and I put a blanket on my uh, legs because I get very cold. I put a pillow behind my back, and then I put my hands together like this. And then I just close my eyes and just deliberately slow my breathing down. So without practice, it takes about 20 minutes for you to get into a quiet state. And this is where most people get frustrated. They stop at 10 minutes. They go, I can't do it. So it takes a little bit of practice. That's why if you read ahead of time, your mind gets very quiet. So you're, you're taking a big chunk out. So you slow your breathing down, and I do that deliberately, just big breath in, big breath out, and just a few breaths to help me. And then I relax and relax, just let go. You want to get centered in the very present moments of now. I'm not thinking about the past. I'm not thinking about what I have to do today. I'm just deliberately getting quiet and centered in this very presence of now. And then I use the mantra, peace, peace, peace. And that helps center my thinking away from all the, the monkey chatter. You're still going to have random thoughts. The, the brain is always active, but you learn not to uh, grab onto these thoughts. They just float away and they get fewer and fewer. You say, I'm going deeper and deeper into my mind and get very quiet and very comfortable. And then finally, my, at the deepest point, and especially on a longer meditation, I always start with, Father, hold me. Divine love, hold me. Divine love, reveal yourself to me. Let me hear your words. 
or the ultimate for me is I and my father are one. Now you start to feel this, this love come into your heart and this presence just hold you. It's so comforting. And it's like I'm a little child again being held by a loving parent who loves me unconditionally. So that's my meditation. Sometimes if the neighbor's dogs are barking really loud, I put sound canceling headphones on. And the other thing I do, if it's too bright, we have a south facing window, I put sleep shades on and that, that's my cave. And it also tells my children, leave me alone. <laughs> I'm meditating. So it helps everybody to know this. And I guess the final thing is have a set time. So for me, seven o'clock is whatever's going on. Seven o'clock is my time, seven to seven thirty. So it's a very simple meditation. It's a very simple technique. I didn't go to school for it. It's just what I felt guided to do. Pairing a word such as peace with your breath can be really helpful with meditation. Is that something you do as well? I know I was trained to repeat silently in your mind a meaningful word or phrase or prayer on the out breath because that's when the body, the physiology of the body relaxes. I like Hugh Prather, who his his meditation was I breathe in peace, I exhale my release. So I'm surrounded by a white cloud of love. It just it, it envelops me. And so I'm I'm breathing this in. And then on my exhale, all my negative thoughts, my concerns, I'm exhaling as darkness. So I'm breathing in light. I'm exhaling my release, which is darkness. Those are really helpful suggestions of how meditation helps you quiet your mind and connect with divine love, which is very beautiful. When you were practicing as a physician, at what point in your career did your mystical abilities begin sort of spontaneously versus kind of accelerate with meditation? When I first started medical school, it was study, study, study. And it was more towards my internal medicine that I started to feel something. And I didn't know what it was, but I started to trust it. And I started to see and hear gradually. It, this process is very gradual, and it's very startling. When you hear voices in your head, that's called schizophrenia. And when the voice is telling you what's wrong with the patient and what to do, it's, okay, I'm hearing things. <laughs> We're not taught to accept things like that in society. Usually when I hear people saying they're hearing voices, I lock them up. That's what I do. So I didn't tell too many people what I was hearing and what I was experiencing. But it starts off very gentle as a guidance. It's like, this patient, something's not right. I wonder if this is what's going on. And it's very gentle, very quiet. And so you poke around a little bit and say, oh, look at that. This test is really abnormal. I'm going this pathway. So that guidance gets stronger and you, you gain confidence in it. And then you get occasional, it's like the old Ford engines trying to start them. You had to crank them quite a bit. But I would get occasional messages. So a patient comes in and he has a syncopal episode at home, which means he passed out. And his primary care said, oh, you had colonoscopy yesterday. You're probably dehydrated. Go to the ER. So he comes in and looks fine, looks great. I feel good, doc. Nothing's wrong. And I gave him fluids. And the fluids, the blood pressure went up and it came down. Then the voice said, you have a problem. Look at his eyes. So I pulled his eyes down and they were sheet white. And the voice said, he has a GI bleed. Get a stat trauma CT scan, which we did. And sure enough, uh, his spleen was ruptured in half from the colonoscopy, so he's bleeding to death internally. It takes a lot to accept that at first, it's like, but it's so crystal clear, it's so forceful. There is no doubt. 
Now, this guy had a syncopal episode. My nurses thought, what is he doing? They didn't see me look in the eye. They didn't know what I was thinking. But suddenly we're all, I said, grab him. We're going to run with the gurney down the hallway. And they have no idea why we're running. <laughs> but I heard this voice. I trusted it. And it saved his life. But if you're not used to that, it's very startling. So it comes on gradually in the majority of the cases, more of as a, a little whisper. And you go, oh, okay, don't use this antibiotic, use this antibiotic, because he has an atypical infection. Oh, he's got a broken bone. Oh, it, you need to get an x-ray. But everybody tells me not to get an x-ray, but I get the x-ray and mm, he's got a broken bone. It starts off gradually like that. You know, it sort of follows human development as well in the embryonic stage. Hearing is one of the first senses to develop. And what we hear is our mother's heartbeat. The so you're starting to feel the presence. You're starting to hear. And the next thing that you get is, is, is vision, at least for me. I, I don't know about other people, but it was a growth process, a, a growing, a maturing and finally into a confidence. I didn't mention the lady with the heart issue, but I've seen um, other people that have had medical problems. For example, um, a demented lady was brought in, and I looked at her, listened to the family, and I just looked down, and I saw that her right, excuse me, her left knee was fractured. And she can't tell me that. Another lady came in and was complaining of right shoulder pain. She said, this really hurts. And I said, has anything happened? She says, no. Well, maybe. I had a little fall, but it wasn't that bad. And I looked at her and I thought, oh, I could see that she had a transverse um, non-displaced fracture of the uh, humerus, the bone in her shoulder. So we x-rayed it, and just the finest fracture line was seen. So you go through this process of, of starting to feel there's gentle guidance, then you start to hear, and then you start to see. And the fun part comes at the end, at least for me, is the integration of all of that, is you see and hear at the same time. So Jody and I had a, a friend. She was a 90-some-year-old lady in a nursing home with dementia. And uh, we called her Mommy. I never knew what her name was. Jody called her Mommy. Lovely lady. And one day she told Jody, I want to go home. I want to go home. So Jody called me and told me this, and I invited the divine Christ to come in because I knew she was ready to leave this world. So I'm at home about a week later, and I'm making a sandwich on the countertop, and I look up, and there's this beautiful white aura of this lady, Mommy, and Christ together in my uh, dining room, kitchen area. And they're on, on the right side, and she just smiled at me and said, thank you. And then they went off, and I've seen this so many times, but th th these beautiful golden doors open, and they go into that, and they, and then everything just floats away. That's the fun part, is, is the integration. So it's a growth process. It's no different than human growth from embryo, embryo all the way up until where we are now. We follow the same path. Well, you said a key word. You said the word trust. And in the development of this kind of skill, Trust seems to be a very significant component because the more you trust it, the more it can come in versus if you have doubt or fear, it can block it. Trust is very important, Emmy. We are trained as doctors that this is in a code situation. There's algorithms we follow and we try not to stray from that. Trust is very important, and that's why it starts off gradually with little things. I was called into this code situation, and there was a patient, a lady 
who was in uh, cardiac arrest. Two code teams tried to revive her and were unsuccessful, which is why I was called in for another opinion. And I stopped, stopped thinking, and I asked, what are we missing? Now, we follow algorithms and code scenarios, which is what these teams were doing, and it wasn't working. This lady was probably four minutes from death. She was modeled. She was unresponsive. She wasn't breathing. And the divine said she has metabolic acidosis, vinegar in her blood from being so sick. And you treat that with sodium bicarb, which is baking soda in a liquid form. So I ordered that. And everybody's like, what are you doing? <laughs> That's not on the algorithm. Here's where I trust that what I'm being told is the, is the solution to the problem. So then her rhythm changed, and she had a second heart rhythm, another malignancy. And I went, oh, I know what that is. And so I was given that antidote, again being guided. Now she's in normal sinus rhythm. And so I'm looking at the code team, and I said, is, is she having a, uh, a perfusing heart? Well, the answer was 15 seconds later, she just jumped up like this and pulled the mask off. <gasps> and we saved her life. So you have to learn. This is really out of the blue. You're giving somebody baking soda, basically, that's dying. What's wrong here? <laughs> you trust that implicitly. And God sees the big picture. I see that much of it. So... And then I was going to share with you a story from my book that a 15-year-old was brought in after dinner by the parents for evaluation. And around the mid-afternoon, he was running in the playing ground and he fell down, kind of passed out for just a moment, but then got up and played the rest of the day and had fun. But he scunned his knees, he scunned his elbows, and his parents were a little concerned, so they brought him in. I'm examining this child. And the, this voice says to me, this child had a heart attack. He has an illness called metabolic syndrome, and he has coronary artery disease at age 15. Order a cardiac enzyme. So I'm ordering an adult test on a 15-year-old, and my nurses are snickering and going, he's tired, it's past his bedtime, all of that. Well, that enzyme came back at 3.57. It should be zero. He had a big heart attack. Now that woke everybody up because they realized that I caught this particular issue and this boy was transferred to Boston. And in his left main artery, he had 95% um, closure of that artery. And we call that the widow maker because it kills you if it totally occludes. So I ordered this test because I trust, I listen and I trust, saved his life. Your trust builds then on these cases. You get more and more and it gets easier because you're confident, you know what's going on. So that's why trust is important and confidence. As that builds, it gets easier and easier. What do you say to someone who might be thinking, well, how do you decipher these thoughts from your own thoughts? Maybe these are just really your own thoughts. You're a highly trained physician. You are advanced trained in, in internal medicine and emergency medicine yes. and ICU care. That's an easy one. Thank you. Um, I'm smart. I'm good. But I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> What the difference in human thought, you hear from both ears, and it allows you to locate something. Spiritual thought has always been my right ear. So what I hear is like somebody talking to me, just like I'm, you're talking to me. There's that. So one ear, not both ears. The second thing I get is, is, is a feeling in my heart, a, a feeling of oneness, a feeling of I know it's like I'm going to take a test and somebody gives me all the test answers. Oh, I know I'm going to pass this test. There's that confidence. That's how you know there's a difference. 
there's also no doubt. In the egoic mind, the human mind, there's always doubt. Well, what about this? What about that? That's the monkey chatter. Your mind gets really quiet and you say, I hear in one side and I have a feeling of this is absolutely the truth. There's no doubt. And once you've had the experience of hearing clearly in that one ear, you'll never doubt again. You'll say, this is different. It's my voice, but these are not my thoughts. So I didn't see that this woman in, in, in the operating suite had metabolic syndrome. Nobody did. They were, they were treating a different problem entirely. So I didn't even have the thought that maybe this is something like metabolic syndrome or maybe this is acidosis. I didn't even have those thoughts. So I got quiet. And then it was given to me. Right. So those meditation practices of quieting the mind and allowing yourself to receive the information, to get quiet and to hear and listen, have helped and guided you. And then also you've had real world experiences in life and death situations where you have listened to it and it's been validated Correct. for you. So then that strengthens that psychic or mystical intuitive muscle within yourself it does the benefit of meditation is is number one you can hear but second is you stay in a meditative state all day long and you're practicing the presence of peace and that peace goes before me and all day long people say you look so peaceful i'm not thinking my mind is very quiet and I'm observing the world. And that makes it very easy for the divine to talk to me because the divine has a very quiet voice. It's a baby's whisper, basically. Unless it's a crisis situation, then it's very loud. Do this now, now, now. You've, you've got four minutes. That's it. And I've had even tighter ones than that. And it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So all day long, I'm in this quiet, peaceful state. And there, as you go down this path, that's why it's easier to hear. And then you start to see. That's a very high energy vibration to be able to see um, different things. Mm -hmm. It's practice. It's practice. What are some of the other ways that people can become a mystic or that, and that you have become a mystic? I know you mentioned meditation and I know you have a couple other steps to share with people. It also helps if you really want to follow this path. If you want to be, if you just want the psychic gifts, you want to be a medium and you really don't care about how deep mysticism can take you, which is to remember that I and my father are one. You can find teachers that will teach you how to be a psychic or how to be a medium and just focus on that narrow area. It's kind of like learning a language. So Suzanne Giesman works quite a bit with people who have passed over and she helps communicate and teaches you how to do that. Um, so there's teachers that could do something specific. I want more than that. I want to know the thoughts of God. I want to know what peace feels like at a very deep level. So I started studying in 2004. Well, let me back up. I think it was in the early 70s, I started reading spiritual literature from Silent Unity, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. And basically, it's questioning the validity of this world and also saying that you have the power within you to heal yourself and create your life. And it was all resonated with me, but I didn't do anything with it. In 2004, I went through a divorce, which took everything from me. That was my crash and burn. Meditation is a much easier way to be a mystic. I highly recommend it as opposed to crash and burn. But the crash and burn took everything away from me. And as I started rebuilding my life, I picked up this book called A Course in Miracles. And in that, it started to talk about the unreality of this world and that you are divine spirit, you are divine consciousness. All minds are one. 
you are individualized Christ consciousness, divine consciousness, your pure love. And I started to accept that belief. And I started to question my human beliefs that I'm a body. That starts to liberate your mind and expand your mind, if you will, into whole new areas and beliefs about myself and say, is this true or is it not? So I've been studying that book now. I read it once a year. There's daily lessons. Then I started branching off and read more of Silent Unity. And then in the last three years, I've been working with um, someone who's passed away is Joel S. Goldsmith, who wrote The Infinite Way. So, and there's a lot of other books out there and authors. There's um, Mari Perone, A Course of Love, and um, Sebastian Bakley, Beckley, Choose Only Love, Eckhart Tolle, I think it's The New Earth. But you want to find something that resonates with you to help you unlearn this world that brings you freedom. And and it, go to some courses and find what works for you. But that brings you freedom. Then there's the meditation, which is the quieting of your mind. And then the third thing that you have to work on is practicing the presence or as Thich Nhat Hanh and most of, of the Buddhists say, is mindfulness. So all day long, I have learned to take a step back, and I look at this world and say it's an illusion. It's a creation in, in, in our mass hu human consciousness. So I look at, at wars, for example, this Pakistan war and Israeli war. When I heard about it, I went into a deep meditation and I found that the people that were killed, and they were very confused and scared and terrified. So it's a light gray background. They're kind of white images of people. And um, I'm talking to them, and I explained to them that they died. And a lot were shocked, and a lot were angry, but a lot were given the choice that you can go home. And so a lot of them left. I got to watch it. It's really quite lovely. So the third part, practicing the presence, is to step back and I start to offer compassion and love to everybody. Yesterday in Maine, a gunman shot 40 people in a bowling alley and 15 died. This morning I did a meditation and I blessed this man with love because it's a deep cry for love. I also blessed the people that died, and I found them and helped them to transition into into uh, divinity, heaven, whatever you want to call it. But both sides need love. We get stuck by passing judgment. The Ukrainians are good. The Russians are evil. The Palestinians are bad. The Israelis are good or the other way around. However you want to choose it, we're stuck with duality. Our job as a mystic now, it's fun to talk to people and save people, but you are becoming what's called a light of the world. You are becoming a true healer in the divine sense. And you can step back and start to look at all of these wars, these poverty, these gunmen, like a movie, and say, I am going to shine light on these people. It's like they're a 25-watt light bulb. I want them to get up to 50 watts because they'll lose all of that insanity behavior. Then I want to get them up to a 75 watt. Then I want them up to a 100 watt. And as the light gets brighter and brighter and brighter, what happens? You see farther and farther. They're becoming closer to their divinity. That's what I want. So being a mystic, one of the um, side effects, if you will, is you feel this divine love. And you just want to give it to people. It, it, you could see what I see and feel what I feel. Feel this love. You change your thinking. Your life's going to change. It's going to heal. That's a beautiful gift to give. What happens is then life gives love back to you. And it gets to be a circle of I give love, I give light, and gratitude comes back. And even when people pass away, I've had three people appear 
and they've all said thank you because we're done now. We don't have to keep reincarnating. I can go home. You've helped me with that. So I consider one of my jobs as a healer is to lift the energy of the world, lift the light of the world. And I do that in deep meditation. I ask for guidance and say, where are these people that were killed? There they are. And that light comes in from the top down like this and then out your heart. And all these people get blessed. They have a choice to say, yes, I want to go home, which is why I titled my book, When God Calls, Say Yes. I highly recommend it if you're having any problems or doubts. If God's calling, say yes. Or you can be angry and hang on to your baggage and reincarnate and come back. And then you got to work through that again. So you want to stay at a 25 watt light bulb. You don't want to go back home. It's a long winded answer to what you were saying, but this is practicing the presence is not only here in the human world where I bless people that have died, but also in the spiritual world. So I do that all day long by staying calm, not reactive and allowing the divine to come in. It's not all these big magical save somebody's lives. Our dishwasher broke just the other day. And like, okay, that's going to be expensive. So neither Jody or myself got upset. I just said, okay, it's going to be fine. Two hours later, the voice said to me, go to Dunnett's Appliance and shop. So Jody's in the kitchen working away. And I said, we're going to Dunnett's. She said, okay. So we go to Dunnett's and there's a sale, a big sale going on. They're liquidating their stock. And we, we got 20 or some percent off, a couple hundred dollars off. It was a good deal. And there was all these stainless steel uh, washing mach or dishwashers. And Jody wanted white. How many white ones do you think there were? There was There's one. So it's not only the big stuff saving people's lives. It's also, I will take care of you in all areas of your life. That's a mystic. All areas are encompassed in love. All areas are blessed. And that means I'm blessed and taken care of. The mystical ability can apply to practical situations in life. The mystical abilities apply to every situation. It was very dramatic for me in the ER because it was life and death. I don't have a lot of time. God is very clear and very loud. Yes, sir. In my life, I lost my wallet. And I go, God, where's my wallet? And he said, it's upstairs in your back pocket of your pants from yesterday. Thank you. Rather than run all over the house, there it is. Or I lose my cell phone. Or I need to make an investment. Or do I buy this or do I buy that? The more I learn to step back and allow the divine to help me, it's like um, I'm off the crooked roads and I'm on the straight roads now. And it's like the divine is, is for me is right here. I can feel this presence a little in front of me, holding a light, guiding me. And when my ego mind kicks in and tells me, oh, check the shop, check the car, check your, all that running around, immediately stop thinking. I stop and I want to listen. What does God have to say? That's a mystic. I stop thinking. What does God have to say? And he'll tell you. As you have truth, trust, and confidence, it gets easier and easier. So everything is taken care of. I'm talking to one of Jody's friends, and I get, hmm, do this for this person. I'll say, Jody, you know, maybe your friend should try this medicine. Really? Didn't think of that. It's not all the excitement of the ER and the drama. It's it's everything is taken care of. With those examples that you gave of you working as a physician do really command attention because they are in life and death situations that require quick responses. So how do you define 
God. <laughs> That's the the problem is you can't describe God. You can use adjectives, but God doesn't speak. God is pure energy, pure love. Just saying that he's energy and love, we all have different definitions of love. Well, God is one. So it's hard to give an answer to that it, because in the human world, we have language, we have duality. God does not have language. God is, I am. So an analogy I like to use is I eat an orange and I'm trying to convince you to eat it. And you're going, hmm, don't know about that. It's sweet. It's juicy. It's delicious. It has a wonderful flavor. You'll like it. Trust me. Well, eventually you decide, oh, maybe he's right. I'm going to try it. So you try the orange. You go, oh, how do you describe that? It's juicy. It's sweet. Until you've had the experience of feeling that oneness, that mystical experience where your mind expands into infinity, it, I can't describe Awe is probably the closest I can do. What I would say is like, well, let's go there together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me help you have that experience. And to get trusting and open your mind that I am a divine being. I am individualized Christ consciousness in a body suit. And I think I'm a body having this life. And yes, you are but you're also a divine being that's connected to everything. You mentioned war and mass shootings. How can people choose love and light when there are so many challenges in the world and internally, and even in our everyday experiences where we meet others, where we can have disagreements or disharmony? I just title that duality. I like black, you like white and we're going to fight over it. It's impossible. The, the word that you're looking for is forgiveness. How can I forgive and let this event happen and be at peace? I've had friends get upset because this one drives a Ford and this one drives a Chevrolet, and they're fighting, and they've had fist fights. Seriously? Over a car. <laughs> How do you do it? You have to practice what's called forgiveness. And that means I'm looking through this illusion of a body, through the illusion of a war, and seeing this as a dream. And, and then seeing beyond that to say there's energy, there's love. Everything is composed of love. We arrange, rearrange it in our mind to create this thing called life. If you don't have some kind of a connection to the divine, what you're asking is impossible. It is not possible to forgive completely. You're going to take sides and you're going to fight and say, this is what I'm going to do. But you can stop that thinking and say, I really want to know what peace is like. I'm going to ask for divine help. I'm going to ask for spirit help. Buddha help, uh, Christ help, uh, Holy Spirit, whatever you want. But I invite the divine in to help me change my thinking. And that divine will wash what your human eyes are showing you, this illusion of war, and show you that in all things are created by God, all things are divine light and love. And it's like little children playing with sharp scissors. What do you do? You take them away and you teach them peace. So I don't engage with discussion about wars and gunmen and people who are killed. I see it all as children crying for love. All these people are at 25 watt light. They can't see very far. It's darkness. It's fear. It's hurt anger and revenge, those are very negative thoughts, very negative energy. As you ascend in consciousness, as you ascend in mysticism, yes, you, you get these wonderful gifts, 
but you also get the gifts of looking down on the battlefield and seeing the hurt. And you can't help it but just love them. I just want to love them. I want them to feel this beautiful love that I feel and lift them up. You can't do this by yourself. You have to open your mind and invite the divine in. I had given a lecture oh, about four years ago. A man was sitting with me and his 12 year old daughter was murdered. And he was still in great uh, grief and rage. And I, he's on my right and I'm sitting at this table listening to this story. And it's a loop in his mind of, I just want to kill this man. I, I want revenge. I would just... And then what happened is the daughter appeared on my left and she was wearing this light summer dress, blonde hair. And I started, I said, sir, can you see your daughter sitting right here? She, he's going, no. I said, close your eyes and just get rid of your rage. Get rid of your anger. Let love come in. I said, here's your daughter. She's wearing, it looks like a striped dress. And he's going, I'm starting to see. And in that instant, he found profound healing. My daughter's okay. Tell daddy I'm fine. I'm very happy. Everything's fine. So I just told him that. He started crying. It was like this huge, dark energy lifted off of him. He goes, I'm free. I'm free. My daughter's okay. And this man, he was a child. He didn't know what he was doing. So there's that story that when your perception changes and you're at a higher point of view, I mean, right now I look at you, if I look at you this way or this way, my perception changes and I see you differently. That is liberating. So you're becoming a mystic. You're seeing from a higher point of view and it's wonderful. Then the wars and the murders and the people that are killed are not so bad because love has come in and replaced your human vision with the spiritual vision of love. That's what I see. That's what God sees. God doesn't see the dream or the illusions of this world. God says, I am love. I created you in love. That's all I see. You're having a dream of being this person. I mean, you think you're separate from me, but in a quiet meditation state, we suddenly realize, wait a second, we're the same. <laughs> we're the same. There was a woman, a very high profile woman, and um, they had their son home. He's 20 years old and the father, and they're all just on a Saturday afternoon um, kind of hanging out. And there's a, the doorbell rang. And there was a pizza delivery guy. And they were trying to say, well, who, who ordered pizza? Don't know. The guy had a gun and shot the son in the heart, killed him instantly, turned over and shot the husband in, in the uh, chest, dropped him, and took a shot at the wife. Well, by then she was moving out of the way. And then he's gone, haven't found him. So I'm in a meditation and a friend calls me. So I, I wake up and I listen to the story. I said, well, let me see what I can do. So I went into another meditation and I found the son. And the son was wearing, you know, he's a big kid. Everybody's big to me. Um, he was about 6'1" strong, athletic, full of energy. He was wearing black glasses and a baseball. I learned it was a baseball, but he was wearing a white uniform. And he said to me, tell my mother, I am fine. I am happy. I am so filled with joy and life that I don't want her to suffer and worry about this and let this man go. So I called the mom and talked with her. And the way I know it's true is because nobody knew he wore glasses except when he played baseball and his uniform was white. I said, well, this is odd because I, I see this young man with glasses and she lost it because that was the only time he wore glasses so he could see the balls better. 
And I said, here's the message. I am fine. I am healed. Don't worry. Feel my love. She got to a, to a high level. Her husband lived. He came back a second time. My mother is still angry and grieving. I am fine. Please tell her again. So I called her up and we had a long talk about forgiveness and go to a higher level where your son is because he wants to talk to you. So let go of your anger that's keeping you anchored to this earth, into this horrible situation and say, your son is still here and he wants to talk to you. So we learn with divine insight, I get to see mm, you got a heart problem or whatever, or I get to see beyond the illusions of this war and this battle and this hatred and say, it's all divine energy. They're all crying for love. And that's my job is now to be a light worker and bless the world. Rod, thank you so much for all of the inspiration you provided us today about You're becoming welcome. a mystic. Is there anything else you want to share before we wind down? To all of your audience, what if? I'm nobody special. I'm just Rod. What if you could do this? How would your life change? What if you could see the way I see? What if you could be helped? Consider the possibility that is true, that you are a divine, individualized Christ consciousness. We are all one in divine love, and you have the ability to connect to that. Wouldn't you want to do that? It's up to you. Beautiful. Rod, thank you so much for being with me today. I've truly enjoyed it once again, and I look forward to more conversations well, with you. you. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's another way for me to help spread the word, if you will. And I appreciate it. You're welcome. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now many of you already realize that in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? 